Hello, welcome to this edition of This Month in Lemonade History. This month we're featuring July. I'm your host, Ron Gerard. We're talking to you live from the Gallica Building in uh, Room 22 up on the Historical Commission floor. Uh, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Mary Murata. Mary? Hi, Ron. How Hi, are you? Oh, great. Mary, did you have a great month? Oh, yes, I did. We had a really good month getting ready for this show. And, of course, as a lot of people on TV might know that uh, we're actually filming our show during June. And uh, you've had a great month yourself, haven't you? Yeah. Um, I had kind of a, um, a fabulous month, actually. Um, so about a week and a half ago, now this is... Today is uh, June 17th, two days after Starburst, and uh, I did find out about this till about a week and a half ago. And I was nominated Citizen of the Year Award. And uh, so I had gotten a call from the Starburst Committee uh, congratulating me around 9.30 that night. And I have the awards that they uh, presented me at Starburst, and Bonnie Hathaway was the uh, female Starburst Citizen of the Year, and I want to congratulate her. And uh, so I'm just gonna hold these up and then I'm going to put them in on the timeline as I'm talking about this. But this particular award is from the uh, Senator Dean Tran, and it's from the uh, State Senate. And I'll, I'm going to hang this up on the timeline so you can see it a little clearer. So isn't that cool? And then we have the one from uh, Dean Mazzarella, uh, Mayor Lemister, Citizen of the Year for Lemister. And I thought that was really, really cool. And uh, I just wanted to add is I, I, I almost as I got this re, re, reward award uh, presented to me Saturday, I was almost <laughs> going to ask them if I was I was almost going to say that uh, now that I got Dean's endorsement, I'm going to run against you as uh, for mayor for this coming fall. But I decided better not. You might win. I might win, and I don't <laughs> want that job. But we love you, Dean, anyways. And then. I got this one from the state capitol, I guess. That is Mary from the mm -hmm. state state representative. It's signed by Natalie Higgins, and this is it's got the state seal logo on it and a nice gold leaf over here. I'm only put, putting these all in the frames. And then if that wasn't enough, the society Thursday night when they had a meeting, open meeting, uh, they presented me with this award for scanning and volunteering. I was doing the uh, Rolling Lane collection. We ended up with about 4,400 images, Mary. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I really appreciate all this. And uh, I thank the city of Lemister for doing this. And the, and the, uh, and the, uh, the, the award committees that, that, that present this to the uh, people. But to be honest with everybody, Mary, it's not about me. No. It's about a group of individuals here at the Historical Commission, the Society. Lemons to TV, and most of us are all volunteer members. We don't get paid for what we do, but we love what we do because we just do. And, and our goal, like the society's goal, is to preserve and, and film for the future. And uh, that's what we're all about, Mary. Right. So I just wanted to point out the Lemonster Historical Society gave Ron this award for all his wonderful work. And I also wanted to point out how cool it is that we have an award from Massachusetts House of Representatives the Massachusetts State Senate, and they agreed with each other. Yay! Yay. <laughs> so, um, so, any, so uh, I just wanted to explain about Starburst. Uh, Mary, you, you were in the audience. I was. And when they called the body and I up, how it happens is they had us sitting in the dugout, and then they, they made the announcement, and then they had some, like, uh, Heel to the Chief type music, and they brought Don, Bonnie <laughs> and I, music. I in front of the podiums, and then we uh, we turned around, they, they did the national anthem, and then we went back over to the uh, dugout area till they were ready for us, and then when they played a couple of songs, they, they took an intermission break, and then they called us up on stage, and then, because Bonnie spoke first, and, but when you're up there on stage, there was a big, big light shining right in my eyes, and I couldn't see... <laughs> I couldn't see what I wanted to say, so I, I kind of remembered what I wanted to say. So I said a lot of things from the heart, but actually I'm gonna to read to you what I actually meant to say. Okay, Mary? Okay, ready? let's do it. Uh, okay, so here we go. So this is, this is what I would have said right after I had gotten these awards. This is Ron's acceptance speech. Mr. Mayor Dean Mazzarella, Senator Dean Tran, State Representative Natalie Higgins, Starburst Committee, fellow citizens of Lemister. On behalf of the Lemister Historic Commission 
It's a great honor to accept this award as Citizen of the Year. I would like to thank my wife Donna, my family, my many friends. I'd like to thank the guys at the Lemister Historical Commission, the guys at Lemister Access Television, the Lemister Historical Society, especially Mary Morata of the Lemister Historical Society, filming over there for me, which actually she was filming for me that to make sure I got it on captured it on video. It's kind of it was kind of a switch, by the way, for me to be on that side of the camera instead of the side of the camera that I usually am on. But uh, when I was a kid growing up, I, I went to school with Dean Mazzarella, and I knew him since I'd been five years old. We went to Gallagher together for a couple of years before I ended up leaving school. Um, and the only reason why I left school at the time, Mary, is because uh, my family split up, my mom and dad, and yeah. I was working at the time, and they needed they needed some funding coming in, or she did, and I was helping her out with that a little yeah. bit. So you and worked then, to support I, your family. Yeah, and then I went back to school years later, which I was really proud of, 40 years later, got my GED and some, a little bit of college, and then... Uh, um, where I got most of my education is from YouTube videos and uh, you know just kind of like learning on my own, which I'm really proud of what I've been able to achieve. And uh, so when I when I held the city uh, the citizen of the year from the city of Lamester, I pointed out that mom, this is for you, because really, um, when I was a kid growing up, Mary, I was a shy little kid and I didn't have a friend in the world. And uh, and I had three sisters. I have three sisters that are still around. And when you're a guy growing up with three sisters, it was tough on me to make friends. And you know, all we did was the girly games and stuff like the hopscotch and whatever. Yeah, no and that, brothers. And, and no brothers to do stuff, brotherly stuff. I think you can relate to that. Yeah. And, and but um, but I wanted to thank everybody once again for that. And like I said, my closing remarks was going to were going to be like, um, we're about saving the past for the future, and that's what all our three organizations do. And once again, many of us, like Mary and I, we don't get paid for what we do. And I would never want to get paid for anything that I enjoy doing, Mary. Thank you. I so, agree so, with so, you 100% so, 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 so there. That, so that's really cool. <laughs> so now this brings us to the July calendar, Mary. Are that's you ready? Right, Ron. Well, we had an awful lot of episodes on our slideshow this year, didn't we? Yes, we did. Um, we had... Um, <laughs> All the events that we're going to be talking about, we went on the field this month and we filmed on location. You're going to find it to be really, really fascinating um, with the uh, the locations because a lot of this, the, the scenery, what you might have saw in the past, has all changed. Mm -hmm. Mary, a couple of them like Willem Park. That was we went to Lake Willem and we we, we filmed. Yep. I mean, that's all make all. All built up at condos now. It and is. back then it was all storefront stores mm -hmm. and behind them was the park itself. Yep. And, and and I remember it's sad because I remember when I was a kid, my mom and dad when they when they were together when I was five or six years old, we, we I got photographs of that with me and my sister on, on rides. And, and that's all gone now. It's just, it's sad. It's part of you, growing you, up you, in Lemonster in the old days. Yeah, 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 it is. So are you are you ready to start, Mary? I guess I am. Okay, so um, where do we start, where Ron? Do we start. Okay, well, why don't we start with the first calendar date? Okay. Now, I, I'm once going to remind everybody too that um, we had over 60 calendar dates, and once again, we broke them down to the best and most interesting ones. So even though we're not going to start off at July 1st, all this will be in the slideshow. And watch that, the slideshow. So watch the slideshow, and uh, it's got some great stuff in there, some music and uh, special effects. You're going to really enjoy that. And it's quite different than the talk show. Mary, are you ready? I am, Ron. Okay. Do you want to go ahead with the first sure. one? July 2nd, 1950, Babe's Ice Cream opens for business. That was located on 168 Central Street in South Lemister. And Mary, now I went out there the other day to go film that. And uh, you're going to, we have some actual photographs in, uh, with the video today it's from the past to present. People are going to be really surprised how much it's changed since 1950. And uh, so the, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure what her last name was, but I talked to the owner, her name is uh, uh, Josie, and she was a real sweet girl, and uh, she, she gave me permission to go outside and film. She even opened up the, uh, the balcony for me, and uh, I, I got a lot of great video to show you what it looks like today, but I thought that was really cool, really, really uh, classy of her to let me do that, Mary. Excellent, and that video will be coming up I'm on the timeline? That's correct. Great. July 2nd, 1950. Babe's Ice Cream Stand opens in South Lemonster. July 3rd, 1775. 
the second Lemonster Meeting House is completed. It was situated at the current location of Park Street and Monument Square. One year later, the American Declaration of Independence was read from there. And that's right, Mary. And once again, Mary and I went out there to that location and we filmed uh, the monuments for the coming up. Uh, we filmed almost all the monuments that were up there so we can have the video for future event for our calendar events. And uh, I kind of wish we would have had a uh, video from that, that 1775, <laughs> but we probably don't. But um, just to take a look around at the common to see what's there now, many of the folks don't know, don't, the ones that watch this, don't live in Lemiston no more. So now you can get an idea what Lemiston looks like downtown Lemiston and the places that we film, Mary. And that's what's kind of really neat about doing the video. Today. Yeah. And so that little video is coming up on the timeline. That's correct. July 3rd, 1775. The second Lemonster Meeting House is completed. It was situated at the current location of Park Street and Monument Square. One year later, the American Declaration of Independence was read from there. July 3rd, 1863, Captain Hans Peter Jurgensen is killed in action at the famous picket charge of the Battle of Gettysburg. His body was transferred to the Evergreen Cemetery for a military burial. Mary, did you want to add anything to that? Now, we had a special guest that we went out there, didn't we, Mary? Why don't we you did. explain to I think, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to first say um, thank you to Mike Kerrigan uh -huh. um, for coming out to the cemetery and showing us where this grave site was and telling us a great story about it. That story, um, we videotaped it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and, uh, day before that, Mary and I went out there and we looked for it. <laughs> we must have circled the cemetery about a half a dozen times and we couldn't find it. So thank goodness for Mike. But, uh, Mike knew exactly where it was and, and he, uh, and he narrated a great story and that's all coming in on the timeline, Mary. Thank that's you. Right. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> and it's, by the way, Mike Kerrigan is responsible for the, the, uh, all this, these great, wonderful dates that, and through the research after yeah, the guides at the Lemonster Historical Commission, and, and now the society is working with us with this, Mary. We're very grateful Thank you. for that. July 3rd, 1863. Captain Hans Peter Jorgensen is killed in action at the infamous Pickett's Charge at the Battle of Gettysburg. His body was transferred to the Evergreen Cemetery for a military burial. Okay, uh, Captain Hans Peter Jorgensen was perhaps the most famous Civil War soldier killed and interred here uh, at the Evergreen. Uh, he's from Denmark. He's not a U.S. Uh, citizen or uh, he was just a resident here. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, actually, he was uh, an illegal immigrant. But he came to this country uh, in 1854 and he had served in the Danish army fighting the Prussian troops in 1849. And when he came to Lemister in 1854, he became involved with the piano manufacturing business, which was big business in Lumberston back in those days prior to the Civil War. But when the war broke out, uh, Captain Jurgensen, well, the future Captain Jurgensen, uh, when he signed enlistment papers, the Northern recruiters were very anxious to get him uh, aboard because of his considerable fighting experience against the Germans, the Prussians. Uh, he was wounded seriously at Ball's Bluff, and as he was recovering from his wounds, he actually became a Union recruiter trying to get other young men to join the Union cause. And by 1863, uh, Captain Jurgensen now had command of his own, uh, his own company, and he was attached to the 15th Massachusetts Regiment. And uh, the Battle of Gettysburg started on July 1st, 1863. And um, the first two days of the Battle of the 15th Massachusetts saw some action 
but on July 3rd of 1863, uh, the, the, the all hell broke loose. Uh, what happened there was that uh, General George Pickett was given an order by Robert E. Lee to charge right through the center of the Union line. And the Union had, uh, did hold the, the high ground, which was the uh, strategic advantage on the third day of the battle. And on July 3rd, 1863, in the late afternoon, over 12,000 Confederate troops from Virginia stormed across the field to charge at the Union Center. The first two days of the battle, the, the Confederates had attacked the Union flanks, and now Robert E. Lee figured that the center of the Union line was at its weakest. July 3rd of 1863 was, without question, the most critical day in American history. Uh, the Confederates assumed or theorized that if they broke through the center of the line, uh, they were going to be able to open a path, a road, all the way to Washington, D.C., where they could send their scouts and uh, emissaries over to the White House, over to Washington, D.C., and ask President Lincoln to uh, accept the, the Confederacy for what it was, which was only 91 miles away. Uh, General Lou Armstead was a con Confederate fanatic. And at the height, as the Confederates charged through the uh, field, in through the center of the Union line, General Armistead was, con was determined to carry out his mission, although he had already suffered 50% casualties. And he took off his cap, took his sword, put the sword right through the cap, and said, Virginians, follow me. And they charged. And they actually breached the Union line. And it was at that point, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New York, and Michigan swarmed in to counterattack his offensive. And this is where he was killed on the late afternoon, probably around 4 o'clock in the afternoon of July 3rd. And it was at that point as the Union counterattacked, uh, Captain Jorgensen fell in battle. Uh, General Lou Armistead fell in battle. I believe the Confederates suffered almost up to 60% of the uh, Pickett's charge that, that were involved with Pickett's charge became casualties. Uh, now, the biggest question I had uh, historically was why Captain Jurgensen was not buried at Gettysburg. Uh, over the next several weeks, there were thousands of bodies. There was 51,000 Union and Confederate casualties in the three days of battle. And for some reason, somehow, Captain Jurgensen, who was actually a strange, he was not actually a uh, U.S. citizen, uh, they managed to get his body on a train going from Pennsylvania all the way up to Worcester, Mass, and then from Worcester, of course, up to Lumster, where he is now interred here. And uh, I'm just kind of surprised that uh, the, uh, I believe there was Commissioner David Wills uh, decided through uh, the town of Gettysburg and through the U.S. Congress that we were going to have a national cemetery down at Gettysburg. And of course, Lincoln, Lincoln de delivered his famous address on November 19th of 1863. But why they made the decision to bring Jorgensen up here, nobody really knows. Uh, unless his family had that kind of money from the piano business to bring him up here. But uh, this is where the majority of those soldiers that fell at Pickett's charge were buried on that day over at Gettysburg. But for some reason, of course, here is Jorgensen. So it says here, gave up his life in the cause of freedom at Gettysburg. Uh, Peter saying, I believe that's probably Danish for uh, saying goodbye, obviously. Uh, but Captain Jurgensen uh, was a very, very solid believer in the Union of the United States of America, and that's why and how he gave his life on that afternoon. Thank you, Mike Kerrigan of the Historical Commission for that great story. July 4th, 1824. The second Lemonster Meeting House is taken down at the Common. Geez, that's too bad, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad, but it's... it was replaced by Gardner Hall, so okay. it was all good. Okay. And we went to the we went to Monument Square, <laughs> and as you can see on our videotape coming up, we videotaped the location where the second meeting house was. Yeah, that's correct. Um... July fourth, eighteen twenty-four. 
the second Leminster Meeting House is taken down at the Common. July 4th, 1908. Vandals celebrate the holiday by setting fire to the McKinley Cruiser at Lake Whalum. Now, Mary, you, you and I, as we just talked about in the opening preview of the, uh, the event calendar, that we went down to Lake Whalum and we filmed that. You were narrating a really cool story about how that all started that and, and why, they, why they set it on fire. You gotta remember, it was the 4th of July. And, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was was that kids that did that? The, the well, we must, we can assume they were oh, okay. they were young oh, okay. people. Okay, well, you, well, it, and it, when I was a kid growing up, the fireworks. I used to make my own uh, homemade firecrackers mm -hmm. out of uh, the cap, the old cap guns that we used to have when we guys were kids. Mm -hmm. So they they probably didn't use that type of thing there. But <laughs> knowing knowing kids today, they probably took gasoline or uh, a lighter fluid and lit it on fire. You know. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, <laughs> there were less rules that story, in That story's coming on the timeline, so be watching for that story. It's a really great story that Mary told, Mary. Okay. Here we are at Lake Whalum. My name is Mary Marotta. I'm with the Lemonster Historical Society. I'm here today with Ron Gerard, who is with the Lemonster Historical Commission and his beautiful wife, Donna. We're exploring the environments of the beautiful Lake Whalum that used to be an amusement park and a beach and a very popular place for tourists to come in the early 1900s. Our event today is July 4th, 1908. On this night, vandals burned down what was known as the McKinley Cruiser on Lake Whalum. Now, the McKinley Cruiser was not actually a boat. It was a railroad car, a flatbed car, that was used to represent a McKinley Cruiser in the Republican Convention of 1896. It was used in campaign parades in Fitchburg, in Lemonster, in Clinton, and various area towns. It was built to represent a battleship, but it ran on railroad tracks. It had a full complement of crew, Marines, and a drum corps, 125 men, mostly from the Fitchburg Athletic Club. After the campaign was over, it was brought here to Lake Whalum, and it was installed on pylons near the shore, but far enough away that the tour boats that were very popular on Lake Whalum could go around this fixture. It was lit up with lights at night and it must have been a beautiful sight. Right up there, it was there for about 11 years until that fateful night when some pranksters decided to burn it down to the level of the water. Now the fixture was greatly missed and the people of the area got together and built a replica so essentially this was a replica of a replica. And that lasted there until about 1915. <clears throat> July 5th, 1748. Abiathar Houghton and Joseph Polly joined soldiers to fight Indians who were raiding the John Fitch garrison. Now Mary, you and I uh, took a field trip to Ashby to find this place. And uh, when we did find it, it was a really, really cool sight to go see. Um, so it took us a while to find it, but uh, through the, thank goodness for the GPS, when we came to the uh, where it is, it was a real quiet place. There couldn't have been much traffic that day. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just wondering how many people on a daily basis go drop by, don't even know it's there, don't even know what it is. Yeah, if you're driving down Richardson Road and you come to the intersection with South Road, it's right there in Ashby. It's easy to see once you know it's there. <laughs> that's correct. But, <laughs> and that's where the John Fitch Garrison was. But coming was. up on the timeline, we have video of that, and I actually took a little video of the road sign so you can get an idea where it is in case you want to go visit it. And we talked a little bit about the distance from Lemonster, too, because that's correct. Abiathar Houghton uh, lived in Lemonster, and uh, he was called up to um, defend the John Fitch Garrison, and he had to somehow transport himself from 
Lemonster all the way up to that little place in, in yeah. Ashby probably would have taken six hours of walking to get there. And and I, I'm most willing to bet it wasn't a cut out road or it, it was probably going through a lot of brushes and all that going stuff. Going through just, the just woods. To get over there and, and, the, and the ticks and, and, it, and if it was a summer day, Mary, it was probably hot and miserable. Yep. I, 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 I couldn't imagine, all the way from Lemister to Ashby, I, I mean, kudos for that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you like that, huh? <laughs> July 5th, 1748. Abiathar Houghton and Joseph Pauley joined soldiers to fight Indians who were raiding the John Fitch garrison. We're today here in Ashby, Massachusetts, near the marker that marks the spot where the garrison of John Fitch used to be. The inscription on the marker reads, Near this spot was the residence and garrison of John Fitch, for whom Fitchburg was named. On the 5th of July, 1748, he was attacked by Indians, and after a hot fight, in which the two soldiers with him were killed, he was captured with his whole family and his dwelling burned. All were taken to Canada where they were held about one year and then ransomed. This land at that time a portion of Lunenburg and afterwards part of Fitchburg was later set off to Ashby. This stone was erected by the city of Fitchburg in 1893. July 8th, 1982, Lemister Monument Square Historical District is accepted on the National Register of Historical Places, Mary. Isn't that amazing that all that Monument Square with all those historic mm -hmm. monuments and everything, it wasn't until 1982 That's right. that it was put on the National District. And uh, I have some photographs of Evelyn Hatchie. She was involved with the Historical Commission in that time period with her with some of the other fellow members when they did the dedication for that. And they found a cool article with, the, I think it was Governor Weld, I think it might have been the time. The time Possibly. It yeah. could have been, well, one of the governors anyhow. And uh, with no disrespect for the other ones, if that's not correct. But um, <laughs> anyways... It's in Fitchburg Sentinel article, and it has a photograph in there, and the governor is signing off a piece, piece of paper recognizing the historical district as the common. So that was really, really cool. And uh, so that's all coming in on the timeline, Mary. Thank and, you. For and that. coming in on the timeline, a little video from our visit over there to look at the actual that's, that's plaque correct. that was put there at that time. July 9th, 1740. The first Lemonster town meeting is held at Jonathan White's home at King's Corner. Yes, correct, Mary. And um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that haven't been in King's Corner in area quite a while, don't even know where that is. But um, Mary and I went up there today. There's a couple of farms over there on the left-hand side of the road if you're looking towards the, Le the Lemon Society from the, from the opposite side. And uh, there's a car wash up there that says King's Corner and they have a pizza place on the other side. And I think they got like a news agency stand on the left hand side and some mm -hmm. stores that's on that side, Mary. And uh, we found that to be pretty interesting. Now the toughest challenge that Mary and I had was first of all, that traffic is horrendous going up that way. And second of all, when I get the live feed going on the camera, Mary, yeah. you can't hear yourself speaking if I want to speak over the camera while we're filming live. So what, what I do is I take the actual audio and I pitch it down low enough just, and then Mary or I will do it, um, a voiceover, they call it, and put it over the audio yeah. like, it's, like it sounds like we're actually there mm -hmm. to make it kind of like realistic. And that's how you, you're hearing a lot of these events coming up on the timeline, Mary. One of the, one of the earliest places where there was a home in Lemonster was correct. right there on King's Corner, and it's still a really, really busy, very pop well populated place today. Okay. July 9th, 1740. First town meeting is held at the home of Jonathan White. Jonathan White was born on October 4th, 1708. He was an influential man in the early development of Lemonster, which was known simply as the new Grant at the time. He had a house near King's Corner and welcomed the townspeople to the first town meeting there 
in 1740. He helped build the first meeting house at the current location of Pine Grove Cemetery. July 9, 1934, the Lemister City Council formally accepts the gift of Barrett Park donated by Margaret Barrett, spelled M-A-R-G-A-R-E-T. <laughs> <laughs> And there's a little joke behind that, so I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. But Mary, did you want to explain? We went down to that very we park. We did. And I told a little bit of story about how my, my mom almost drowned in that pond or park. And uh, we have some video coming in on a timeline, some aerial video as well as ground video. And uh, there's a giant snapping turtle in the middle part of the lake in the, in the drone video. And uh, I often have people ask me, um, uh, is there any swimming there anymore? And no, because there's allergy and the bacteria in the water, and you, you would not want to go swimming there. And I wouldn't want one of those turtles coming up and, and biting. And then a snapping, per, snapping turtle the size of a car yeah, inside there. Coming so. up and biting me in the behind. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> but coming up on the timeline, it was a beautiful day, and we got some nice uh, video of what Barrett Park looks like today. And the reason why I was just kidding around Margaret, because one of, one of uh, I won't mention the name, <laughs> one, one, one of the... One of our local historians had a hard time spelling that name, and so he was asking us one day this past week how to spell it. So <laughs> that was just kind of like funny. Little so, joke. Little joke between us. <laughs> Harry? Hi, this is Ron Gerard from the Lemister Historical Commission. Today we're here at Barrett Park in Lemister, just off of Pleasant Street. I'm with Mary Murata from the Lemister Historical Society. And my beautiful wife Donna, and today we're filming live from the uh, Barrett Park Pond. And on our calendar, we have July 9th, 1934. The Lemister City Council formally accepts the gift of Barrett Park donated by Margaret Barrett. Now, I'm just going to tell you guys a little bit about a story about Barrett Park that I recently came across. And I can remember years ago my mom telling me about a story about this. Um, in 1940, my mom was eight years old, and uh, she was swimming with my Aunt Teresa. She was talking to me about that yesterday. My Aunt Teresa was still around. And when they were kids, they were swimming in this pond. And what happened was, an uh, undertow took her and brought her in, and, just, and, she, and she had a hard time getting out of the water. And when they were kids, uh, there was a very scary moment for them and my mom. And my aunt grabbed a hold of her and tried to pull her. She was having all she could do with the pull her. So they got a hold of the lifeguard on duty at the time. And uh, the, between the two of them, they were able to pull her out. And my aunt Teresa told me the other day that uh, she was crying. They were both crying and very upset. And the reason why that story never broke and made the newspaper, you got to remember, it was 1940. And you didn't have the uh, breaking news that you got today with the mobile phones and, and videotaping and everything. So I just thought I'd add that in there as a pretty cool little story. But anyways, this is Ron Gerard signing out. Okie dokie. <laughs> July 11th, 1911. Land on Blossom Street is purchased for the establishment of the first Lemonster Hospital. That, that's correct, Mary. Um, Mary and I, once again, we went out on location. It's coming in on the video. I have a uh, past to present type photograph. Um, Rocky, one of the volunteer members that uh, before he had made a nice composite of all the old photographs and they got that coming in on a timeline along with it, the actual location when we went out there and go film. And once again, the, the uh, audio on the, uh, the the actual from the street noise was terrible. So I, I got it pitched down so you can hear us talking over the over the, uh, the actual video in the spot of the location. But Mary, I, I found it interesting in... Uh, I'm pretty sure you do the same thing. When you're looking at a photograph from the past and you're pairing it up with what it looks like today, today. You, it's like, wow, it's quite a bit changed. Mm -hmm. huh? and, you know. But I think people would be interested to know that the, the building on Blossom Street that was used for the Lemonster Hospital is still there today. That's, cor that's correct. And I, we have photographs of that coming in on the timeline. Thank you for that, Mary. July 11th, 1911. Land on Blossom Street is purchased for the establishment of the first Lemonster Hospital. July 11th, 1998, the Oliver Hazard statue is dedicated at Connor Park. Mary? So, here we go. 
We went to Carter Park and took a video of the Oliver Hazard statue. Yeah, and uh, I just wanted to add to that. I, I, of course, I have many Facebook followers on my Facebook page, and and uh, when I posted that photograph of the Oliver Hazard. Uh, there's about seven or eight members of that family, the descendants of that family got a hold of me and they were thanking me for putting that up there and the general information about that statue. And, and uh, when I'm down here filming with Mary and, and, and volunteering in the office with these guys that I volunteer with and at Society and at Lemister TV, um, I used to think I was just wasting my time, but I realized that I'm not wasting my time because I'm preserving history for our future and I, I really enjoy it, Mary. One of the most exciting things is when a family comes to celebrate their own past. That's correct, and uh, I want to thank that family for that, Mary. So coming up on the timeline, a video of Carter Park. That's correct. July 11, 1998. The Oliver Hazard statue is dedicated at Carter Park. July 15, 1776. The town of Lemister votes for independence from Great Britain. After hearing the American Declaration of Independence, Mary, did you want to talk a little bit about this? Well, a lot of people have read the Declaration of Independence at some point in their lives. It's a really meaningful statement of our intention as colonies to be free from Great Britain. It was really our announcement of the beginning of the Revolutionary War and why we were doing that. That's correct. So I thought it would be wonderful if we could read the Declaration of Independence aloud and listen to the words themselves on the TV show. Yeah, and many of you are going to question something, and I, and I was just looking at the calendar date. Um, in Lemister, it was read off July 15, 1776. Good but point, the, Ron. But, but the actual date was read off July 4th, 1776. So Mary, wh well, why was that? Technically, technically, the, the Declaration of Independence was signed on July 4th. Uh -huh. It was read aloud to the public in Philadelphia on July 5th, okay. the day after. And it didn't really reach Lemonster and wasn't ready for it to be read aloud until July 15th. So there was a 10 day delay for someone to travel and, and from correct. Philadelphia to Lemonster. And I don't know if people are aware of this, Mary, but July 4th, no matter what calendar year, Independent Day always falls on that day. No matter if it's on a Sunday or a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday, we celebrate it on that day for that particular reason. Exactly. But, but right. you gotta remember that um, they didn't have internet, phone, or anything like no. that, so that probably came up by horse and buggy or came up by train, or however it came up, but, <laughs> but it, it got here. That's and, right. And that's breaking news, As Mary. fast as they could get it. <laughs> okay. July 19th, 1946. The Wachusett Shirt Company opens a branch plant in Spofford, New Hampshire. That, that's correct, Mary, and coming in on a timeline, um, we have a photograph of that company from New Hampshire, but Mary and I also went in the original location, which is now a uh, apartment complex. It's on, the Waterway Apartments. It, that's right, and it's on Water Street. And uh, so we went out there the other day, took some video of it, and uh, that's also coming in on the timeline, Mary. Some people will notice that it's changed a lot. Some people might say, like I do, that it doesn't seem to have changed very much at all, and very nice job on restoring that old factory to make an apartment complex. That's right, and, and uh, back in the 70s now, 75 or 76, I had worked there when it was a plastic shop. Oh. I wasn't there very long, but I couldn't, I, it was more like piecework when I was molding, so I, I left shortly, yeah, but I wanted to get an idea on what it, what it was like working there, but it was pretty interesting what they made there. Um, I don't. I was making some little toys that were making on a molding uh, machine and cutting them up with a, with a cutter and trimming the edges and packing okay. them in a box. But yeah, I, I it, it wasn't for me, so I, I left that. <laughs> well, one. the footbridge over the road yeah. is a real landmark. Yeah, and that's still there, and that, that's all coming in on timeline, Mary. July nineteenth, nineteen forty-six, the Wachusett Shirt Company opens a branch plant in Spofford, New Hampshire.
July 23rd, 1835. Samuel Hall, who is known as Buckskin Sam, is born. He was an Indian scout, a Texas ranger, and a writer of dime novels. Yeah, that's correct, Mary. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank Mike Kerrigan from the Lemmis Historical Commission. Um, Mike was uh, gracious enough to come out on location with us. And, uh, and like I said, once again, Mary and I, we drove around like a, not in a cuckoo bird, uh, looking around for this particular uh, stone at the uh, cemetery. And uh, Mike knew where it was right away because he's been there a number of times in the past. And uh, Mike told a really cool story about the uh, Buckskin Sam. And uh, so you're going to find that pretty interesting coming in on the timeline, Mary. We learned a lot about a very interesting Lemonster character. Now, from time to time, um, when Mike feels up to it and feels, uh, feels good, um, we're going to have him come in and sit, up, sit in with us and go over some calendar events with us because Mike, Mike is a... Um, really great historian, and, and Mike just doesn't only write these stories, he tells stories about the stories that he writes, and uh, we want to thank Mike for that. Well, you'll know what we mean when you watch the video as he tells the story about Buckskin Sam. from the Lemonster Historical Society. I'm here today with Ron Gerard and with Mike Kerrigan, both from the Lemonster Historical Commission. July 23rd, 1835. Samuel Hall, known as Buckskin Sam, is born. He was an Indian scout, a Texas Ranger, and a writer of dime novels. Mike, do you have any more information about Sam? Yes, hi, good afternoon, Mary. Uh, Buckskin Sam, Samuel S. Hall, his legal name, uh, was indeed probably the most, perhaps the most interesting character person ever uh, be raised in Lumbister. Uh 1835, he was born uh, down in Worcester, and he had some siblings that were born down there as well. Uh, this is their family plot. Uh, Sam was raised in Lumbister, and by his early 20s, uh, he was, because of his personality, his character, he was uh, considered Lumbister to be very boring, or too boring for his own lifestyle. So he moved all the way down to Texas, and uh, he started to enjoy the lifestyle of being uh, out on the Texas prairie. I believe at that point in time, Texas in 1845 had become a state of the United States. But uh, the war between the states started, and uh, up, to, up until that time, Sam had already become a Texas Ranger. And uh, when the war between the states broke out, he became essentially a double agent. And he was conscripted into the Confederate Army and after a brief stint with their confederacy, he swam the Rio Grande and deserted into the Union ranks. And after he was debriefed or interrogated, they allowed him to uh, ride on horseback all the way back to Lumster after he uh, gave the Union intelligence any information they knew of the Confederates down in Texas. And while the war was going on, Sam then enlisted with Company B, the 5th Massachusetts Volunteer Regi Regiment, and he became a, uh, a scout for the Union Army down in the Southwest. And this continued, obviously, until 1865. The Union won the war, and Sam was uh, taken out of the Union Army. But his love for adventure and uh, his uh, way of life he knew that Lemister really wasn't meant for him as far as uh, actually living there as a full-time resident. But anyway, Sam, uh, he was a hard drinker, an excellent fighter, excellent shot, and a fine horseman. Uh, probably 
Lemus Tazansa to Clint Eastwood. You could probably say it in a limited way. Uh, he just, uh, when he became, uh, his, his life, when he began his life again back out in Texas, he rejoined the Texas Rangers and he met Kit Carson and Buffalo Bill out there. And uh, he actually brought, it is rumored, he brought Kit Carson back to Lemister with him. And uh, they got seriously intoxicated one night over in the center of Lemister. And uh, the Lemister townsfolk did not like it. And it was just another black mark on Sam and his uh, lifestyle. But he was a, uh, a scout in the Texas Ranger. And he decided towards, uh, by his late 30s, of putting together dime novels. He put together 54 dime novels for the youngsters of the country at the time of his experiences as a Texas Ranger, an Indian scout with Kit Carson, and uh, that of Buffalo Bill. And they sold like hotcakes back then. And uh, Sam came back again to Lemister I believe for a centennial celebration of Lemister, uh, the country's cent uh, centennial celebration, and he asked to be a marshal or to, to lead the parade in 1876, I believe it was, and they turned him down. And with that insult, Sam felt that uh, that was it with Lemister, and he moved down to Delaware eventually, and he continued to, through Beetle Publishing Company, he continued to uh, publish his dime novels about his adventures as both a ranger and as a scout. And in February of 1886, he passed due to pneumonia, and uh, people thought that he was broke, and he probably was, but the Beetle Publishing Company had proceeds from his uh, dime novels, and they arranged to transfer from uh, Wilmington, Delaware. He'd been staying with a family by the name of Dutcher down in Wilmington, and they arranged to have the body brought from Delaware back up to Lemister, and this is where Sam Hall now rests. So he uh, was probably considered a ruffian, and Lemister's answer to Clint Eastwood in a certain way, but Lemister did not really truly appreciate Sam, and uh, this is how Sam finally made his way back up to Lemister. Uh, not as a hero, probably, but uh, through succeeding generations, uh, I think he became more appreciated. So uh, that is how this all ended with Sam in 1886. Certainly a man of his times. Yes. I don't know how I did on that, but... That was wonderful. July 30th, 1945. Work begins on an edition of the Lemister Hospital. Mary, did you want to talk about that a little bit? <laughs> well, I think a lot of people probably realize that there's always a lot of additions being made at the Lemonster Hospital, or mm -hmm. what it's called today is Health Alliance Hospital. What a lot of people don't know is that the planning for the first hospital began way back in 1902. Mm -hmm. There was a Dr. Cohan who at that time decided he wasn't going to be waiting for a plan, and he opened up a building on Merriam Ave mm -hmm. to be the hospital. In 1909 was when they bought the land to, on Blossom Street, for the real Lemonster Hospital, Dr. Cohan immediately closed the building on Merriam Ave and he went to be the, the uh, chief of surgery at the hospital on Blossom Street. Mm -hmm. And then after that, when the hospital at Blossom Street got to be too small, Mr. Bernard Doyle, a very famous man who, who donated the land for Doyle Field, um, he donated the land for the real first Lemonster Hospital on Hospital Road, where it's located today. Yeah, and that, that's correct, Mary. And uh, I just want to point out to everybody, if you have any old video, uh, old photographs of Lemonster, the Lemonster Historical Society and or the Lemonster Historical Commission would be gladly accept donations. And if it's, if it's on film, uh, I, we'll, we'll get the video transfer from Lemister Access Television as long as you give us permission to use it. And uh, but where we get most of these old photographs from, people donate them to the society, or right. donate to us, and they and they give us permission to use them. And uh, so that that's where we so coming in on the timeline for the event that Mary talked about, we have a number of different photographs along with the actual video the day we went down there to film Mary. And Ron's like a genius. 
at reproducing old photographs and stuff. It's just amazing. Yeah, it's something that I really enjoy doing, and uh, I just kind of like getting these guys sometimes. Is, uh, I'm going to just put this out to the public. Um, I would love to get a nice sleep number bed back here with cable <laughs> TV and uh, all the accommodants are home. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want no pets, but... but, <laughs> but, but um, that yeah, would be great, you know. And this, but it was, to be honest with you, Mary, this is um, what I do for the city of Lemister. This is kind of like a second marriage for me, made in heaven, and I really enjoy what I could do. And, and I'm very, uh, I'm very dedicated, with, along with a uh, great, great group of people that I volunteer with that, that feel the same way about I do. Yeah. And and, uh, and I appreciate that, and I appreciate these awards that I got this past week, Mary. All the time that we put into our historical work for me is a great pleasure. Yeah, and uh, I'm a Lemister native. What that means is I was born in Lemister. Mary's a, uh, uh, she came in from Lemister in '86. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good win situation for Mary and I because I'm learning. Mary's learning a lot from me about Lemister, and I'm learning a lot from Mary, with because Mary was a technical writer from a previous job. So she's really helping me with my grammar and my spelling and everything, and uh, which is really something I was struggling with, and I really appreciate that, Mary. And together, we do great detective Yeah, work. it's kind of like uh, Lester and Earl, or <laughs> Abbott and Costello, or I would say the Three Stooges, but there's not a third one here, so, but... Uh, only in our minds. <laughs> only in our minds. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mary. And that brings us to the last calendar of the event. July 31st, 1969. Mary, did you want to talk about that event? Well, I'd love to, Ron. We feel really proud of that. The Lemonster Historical Society purchased the Field School building on School Street on that date That's correct. to make it into a museum. Now, 1969, and it took a couple of years to renovate the building, mm -hmm. so even though we only paid a dollar for it, a walking ball, mind you. <laughs> we probably paid a lot, lot, lot more than that to renovate the building and make it useful and make it meaningful as a museum and an event space. And, that, and that's correct, Mary. And coming in on a timeline, Mary, uh, through her research, found the number of photographs while it was under renovation. And I got that coming in on a timeline, what it looks like today. And uh, if you guys have never been to the society or the, the commissioner's office, I highly recommend a visit. Um, if you're a uh, science fiction fanatic like I am and you watch the Indiana Jones movies, uh, Indiana Jones was something that looked like it was supposed to be Area 51 and they were searching through these archives looking for an artifact. Mm -hmm. Well, when you go to the society, that kind of reminds me of that because everything's in boxes well organized in the back room and you're welcome to open up a box and look at it. If something's interesting to you, she just asks that you put it back the way you took it out and put it back on the shelf where you found it. But um, when I when I go up there with Mary and I and I search the archives what they have over there, I'm like, wow, you had like 113 years of Lemister history, and it's really awesome seeing all that stuff. And incidentally, Mary, what hours do they open up at the society so people can know, that's know what a good, hours? That's a very good question. Thank you for asking, okay. Ron. Okay. So what what hours are they open? <laughs> We're open on Tuesday mornings from nine to twelve, and Saturday mornings from nine to twelve. We welcome you to come in and visit. Just look at our exhibits. Talk to us about what you're interested in or actually do active research. And that's correct, Mary. And, and if they can't get there on those days, I'm sure they're open to where you can actually make an appointment and you'll find time for that's them. That's right. Call us on the phone or get into our website and contact us and we'll make an arrangement. And, and as you're walking in over there to the right-hand side, they got a nice display case of a uh, number of different books that Mark Bedanza, a historian, selling. And we have Coleman to Limits to History there. That's a great... Uh, resource this is where we're getting a lot of these great dates from yeah and uh incidentally the Olympus historical commission on the other hand mary we're open tuesdays and thursdays from nine o'clock in in the morning to noon time and uh, both days and uh you know, once again if you want to come up here on a on an off day i'm pretty much here five six some, or sometimes seven days a week sometimes eight days a week yeah exactly and then I got, uh, if, if you drive by this backside of the gallery, the uh, city hall, if you see a blue car there, that's my car. So, <laughs> so uh, when I was speaking about this this past month, Mary, at the society, um, I'm here so much that if I, didn't, if I didn't come here one or two days in a row, the Lemister Police Department would send a cruiser down my house and want to know if I'm okay. Yeah. Because they all know who I am. 
I'm, uh, I'm on a first name basis with over 90% of the people at the police department, which is really a great experience for me, making some great contact with them, the library, you guys, and LTV, and uh, it's, it's been a wonderful experience being recognized and now recognized for Citizen of the Year. And it's been a really great experience volunteering for our city, Mary. And for us to be able to be part of it and to yeah. help people see what there is available and all the great places around Leominster that have a real deep historic meaning or story to them is just, just great fun. So Mary, um, this brings us to the closing uh, of the uh, July show. Mm -hmm. I wanted to point out to the audience that be watching for the August show because you're going to have something really special coming up the very 1st of August. I Guess can't. what? Yours truly was born Citizen of the Year. So <laughs> we got that to look forward to along with some other great calendar events, Mary. <laughs> so look forward to that. So this wraps up another great edition of This Month in Lemister History, Mary. It's a good time. Good time. I'll see you guys around see town. See you next month. Bye.